Good morning, good people. Uh, I think we have Emily coming up to read for us. Hey, Emily, come and read the scripture for us. Each week, we're just reading all the Beatitudes to give us the context. So here we go. Uh, if you're able, why don't you stand with me while I read? This is um, Matthew 5, verses 1 to 10. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. By the end of this time, I'm hoping to have convinced you of two things. First, that you'll be convinced that the word meek does not mean weak. And the second thing you'll be convinced that living meekly is the most compellingly beautiful way to live. In fact, you'll be so convinced that you will skip out of here bursting with excitement to take the first opportunity you possibly can to do something that is meek. Do you think I'm up against a challenge there? Do you think I might succeed? Do you dare me? Are we going to go for this, yeah? So just before we jump in, let's pause with a quick self-reflection. As you arrive today, what definition do you carry of the word meek? When you think of meekness, what's your default image or description. You know, just picture a meek person or a person acting meekly. What do you see? What words might you use to describe them? Would they possibly look a bit like this guy? Would you possibly use words like timid, shy, powerless, Or, when you imagine meekness, do you imagine someone like this? Would you use words like strong, confident, dynamic, powerful? Well, it may surprise you, but biblically, the second image, this one, is actually closer to the true definition. And interestingly, this picture is actually of someone whose first name is Meek. This is a rapper called Meek Mill. Biblical meekness is not weakness. And the simple reason we can get to that conclusion is this. Jesus describes himself as meek. And we can safely say that Jesus is not weak. Matthew eleven twenty nine, Jesus says, I am meek and lowly in heart. Jesus, the most powerful, dynamic, confident, courageous person in the universe, says, 
please call me meek. My very heart is meek. He doesn't say I'm sometimes meek. He says my very heart is meek. At the core of me, the essence of who I am. From the wellspring of the way I live towards you, I am meek. So what does it really mean? The true meaning of meekness is power that is intentionally laid down for the sake of another. Meekness is taking one's own power, one's own strength, one's own resources and channeling them, surrendering them, submitting them for the sake of others. It is not a lack of power. It is directed power. And the submissive direction of that power is for others. It is not for self-interest. It is for the interest of others. That is meekness. So Philippians 2. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. That is meekness. John 13, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. That is meekness. Matthew 20. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is meekness. John 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That is meekness. I am meek and lowly in heart. Jesus' whole lifestyle, his mandate, his example is meekness. He takes all his divine power, his strength, his resources, and he uses them in a servant-hearted way to wash the feet of the world. You know, the book of Revelation tells us that all power, all strength, all wisdom, all wealth belongs to Christ. All the power, all the strength, all the wisdom, all the wealth in the universe are his. And what does he do with it? He uses it to redeem the world. He directs it and channels it for our sake, for our salvation. Colossians 1 says that Christ used the fullness of all God's resources in him to reconcile us to God. To make peace with us. And in fact to make peace with the whole universe. Second Corinthians says that Christ took his riches. His wealth. And spent it on us. Transferring his wealth to us. Impoverishing himself. So that we would experience his spiritual wealth. And you know when we start to read all the scriptures about Christ. Through the lens of the Beatitudes. It unlocks all this insight into the way of Christ. Could it be that the Beatitudes, at least on one level, are Christ describing his own way of living in the world? Blessed is Christ who becomes poor in spirit, embracing 
our spiritual poverty and lostness on the cross, even experiencing forsakenness by God so that we would receive the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is Christ who enters our mourning, our pain and brokenness, embracing grief and rejection in order to be our comforter. He weeps over Lazarus, weeps over Jerusalem, as one who is determined to bring comfort. Blessed is Christ who takes a posture of meekness, pouring out his power and riches for our salvation. You know, blessed is Christ who hungers and thirsts for the righteousness of God's design to be restored to our lives. Living a perfectly righteous life so that he could lead us like a good shepherd into the paths of righteousness. Blessed is Christ who, who demonstrates relentless mercy towards those he meets. Showing us what mercy looks like. Starting a revolution of mercy in the world. Blessed is Christ who carries a purity of heart, a worshipful and adoring posture to the Father, showing us the face of the Father. Blessed is Christ who is the ultimate peacemaker, the firstborn of all God's children who carry the royal DNA of princes and princesses of peace in the world. Blessed is Christ who embraces persecution for righteousness, you know, just enduring even the cross for the, enjoy, for the joy of the kingdom set before him. Are the Beatitudes, at least on one level, Christ's way of saying, this is how I'm living. This is how I'm bringing the kingdom. I think as Peter Burton so importantly pointed out last week, the Beatitudes can be seen as a, a prophetic declaration of what God is doing in the world. You know, it's linked fundamentally to the, to the prophetic words of Isaiah 61, which Jesus himself quoted as his mandate in Luke 4. You know, this is what it looks like for the kingdom to come. And the words of Isaiah 61 are mirrored in the Beatitudes because they describe the way God is going about preaching good news to the poor, the way he's proclaiming his freedom to the captives, the way he's delivering comfort to those who mourn, the way he's restoring devastated communities and um, you know, rebuilding broken lives. That's the way he's doing it. And so even when we feel a kind of meekness that is by a circumstance and not by choice, you know, when our power is given away or spent uh, in ways that are unwillingly costly to us, when we feel crushed or downtrodden by systems or circumstances, even then we can remember that Christ enters that with us. And shares with us his inheritance. If today you're here and you are feeling defeated. Remember that Jesus first spoke these beatitudes to a people who were under the hill of the Roman Empire. Who were feeling bullied and, and impoverished and bereaved. And his Beatitudes were and are promises to them about the way that he was bringing his kingdom breakthrough. So take heart, because the meek will inherit the earth. This very Beatitude, the meek will inherit the earth, is, contains a hyperlink to Psalm 37 which is a whole psalm exploring this, this tension of living in a world where it seems like others are flourishing and, and we're just trying to be faithful and trust God and yet feeling like it's not working. And, and if that's you today, I just encourage you to take time to read Psalm 37 and allow Jesus to speak his promise and his comfort to you. So blessed are the meek. 
They live beautifully in a broken world. They are not self-seeking or self-interested. They don't see their power or their gifts or their position as resources to build their own self-seeking world. Instead, they take their power and they intentionally direct it, submit it to the purposes of God. Choosing to submit to the purpose of building a more beautiful world. Galatians 5, 23 in the message, I think we've got this up here, describes it like this. We find ourselves not needing to force our way in life, but able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. I love that line. Not needing to force our way in life, but able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. We're people who are not forceful. We're not um, doing it like the world says we should, selfishly and aggressively fighting to win at life. Stepping on others just to get ahead. That's not us. Instead, we marshal and we direct our energies, our resources, our power wisely. You know, we comfort those who mourn. We demonstrate mercy. We work towards peace. It's costly and it's sacrificial, but it is the most beautiful way to live in our broken world. It is the very way of Christ. And when I think of meek people, defined as those who direct their abilities and their gifts and their resources towards others. I think of people in this church like Chris Kachani, who, um, you know, he's one of the smartest businessmen I know and could be living a kind of globe-trotting, successful, powerful life, you know, winning at life in the city and that, and yet he's taking his resources and his gifts and his strategic brilliance and using it to build Waverly Abbey, build something beautiful there. Or I think of Chris Leach, who um, similarly could have kept a, a, a fantastic career in the, in the city, but has instead retrained as a coach and a mentor, and is often helping young people to get established in life and work, and empowering and equipping them to thrive. You know, he was part of our Launchpad project at the Lighthouse, helping unemployed people back into work, directing his energies into building something beautiful. I think of Pete and Dawn Bennett, who are standing for election as local councillors, and uh, solely for the order of uh, uh, the purpose of serving the community they find themselves in. And when they made the decision to stand, their first instinct was to contact Rebecca and me and say, if we get elected, what could we do with that position towards social transformation? You know, they want to direct their energy in that way. I think of the current mayor of Guildford, Dennis Booth, who is not using his influence to swan around in gold chains and, and all of that and you know, receive praise from people, but he's using his time as mayor to put a spotlight on little-known charities doing beautiful work in the community. In fact, he's also using his resources and time to try and help us find a suitable building in Guildford for a, a lighthouse. You know, he's channeling that energy in a very intentional way. I think of the many teachers in this church who are pouring their lives out for all those students, all those pupils. Kate Phillips is one of those teachers who sent me a book called A School Built on Love, all about the inspirational work of a principal in a school in Leeds in a deprived neighborhood who is completely changing the community and the, the, the parents and the lives of the children through building a culture of love, simply through that. And those are the kind of teachers we have in this church who are, are pouring themselves out, directing their energy in that way. You know, Jesus calls them meek. I think of Richard Grove, who's one of the busiest people I know, charging up and down the country all week as a building surveyor, and yet pours hours every week into helping us 
um, were on the technical side of finding a suitable property for the lighthouse, you know, doing all the assessments of refurbishment and what's needed. It's a really complex thing, and he gives so much time to that. Uh, I think of those in the church with significant financial wealth who, who come to, quietly to Rebecca and me and say, how can we invest in the work of the lighthouse? How can we build something with you here? And they would hate me to name them. You know, they just want to do it anonymously and quietly. And yet they recognize that they have resources that they don't want to use just to build their own lives and world. And so they're channeling it powerfully into serving the poor. Jesus proudly calls them meek. I mean, there are so many examples. I could just spend the morning just going around the room, honoring you guys, the many, many people who live in this way. And you may have never labeled yourself in that way, but I just want to say to you, Jesus calls you meek. He loves the beautiful way you pour yourself out for others, the way you channel your time and your energy and your resources towards living beautifully in a very broken world. Philippians 2, 3 to 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In meekness, we adopt this Christ-like posture. And honestly, that posture, I think, requires a consistent, courageous choice to keep surrendering our lives to God. I mean, all those leaders who stood up earlier, who volunteer their time, leading collectives, leading the board of trustees and all of that, it's, it's a costly thing to do. And, uh, and it, one has to just keep laying it down, laying it down. For my wife, Rebecca, and I, I think over the years, that has required for us a willingness to keep committing and submitting all our plans to God. Proverbs 3, verses 4 and 5 have been life verses to us. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he'll make your path straight. We've had to come back again and again and again to that. And I've seen Rebecca do this again and again and again, which has helped me do this again and again and again. Um, She'll hate me taking this opportunity to shine a spotlight on her. But I, I just want to tell you that she, I mean, she is one of the smartest, brightest, sharpest people I've ever met. And uh, for those of you who have seen the lighthouse, anything, all the, the beautiful, brilliant things there, it all comes from her genius and creativity. And yet when she was a student, when I met her at sixth form, you know, she was in the Oxbridge student group. And uh, her, her um, teachers and mentors said she could become anything. And uh, she was planning to go and study law and uh, have a successful career as a lawyer. But God asked her to lay down that dream and to direct her strength differently. And so she went on to the mission field and using her passion for justice started to serve people like sex workers in, in the red light district in Amsterdam who'd been trafficked from around the world and orphans in Eastern Europe. She just started to direct her energy in that way. And years later when we were leading a church, Rebecca trained as a life coach to help with pastoring people and uh, one of the sharp um, coaching executives in the, in the church recognized her, her incredible coaching skills and said, do you know what, I, you need to come and work with me. And within weeks she was uh, coaching senior executives and business leaders in, in the business world and was phenomenally successful at it. And if I'm honest, was earning a lot of money doing that too. Uh, I wasn't complaining. Um, we finally got to have some nice holidays. We finally bought a car that hadn't been given to us. You know, it was, it was great. But after a few years of doing that, we came across this derelict building that is now the lighthouse in Woking. And we really felt God calling us into that. And so um, Rebecca said, all right, I'll lay down 
that executive coaching for six months to get this thing started, get the lighthouse started. And that was 12 years ago. She's still there every day, pouring her energy into that. And I've just seen countless times that she's made this choice to keep submitting to God, to keep surrendering, directing her energy in that way. And for all of us, it takes that ruthless willingness to do that, to consistently surrender our lives to God. And it's not always about a dramatic career shift or some huge, you know, change. It's often the simple day by day, hour by hour choices of intention and action. Following the model Jesus gave us, inviting us into this unconventional way of living. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Just my last point on this before we respond. Inheriting the earth is not simply a consolation prize. You know, like, oh, bless you guys who felt like you had nothing on earth. Don't worry, there's a prize waiting for you on the other side. You know, it might include that. And for some of us, we might be reassured by that. It is a promise. But, but it's not simply that. I just wanted to point out that inheriting the earth is the natural outcome for the meek. Now, who are the kinds of people that God wants to put in charge of his world? Those who lead like Jesus. In Matthew 20, Jesus says, you know, the Gentile leaders serve in this sort of domineering, overbearing way that's self-seeking, but not so with you. I'm calling you to a servant-hearted leadership. And those are the kind of people that God wants to give his earth to. I've heard preachers say that the Christian life is training for reigning. You know, we're, we're in, in the next world, God's going to give us positions of, of ruling and that in his world. And if that's the case, who does he want to give that leadership to? To people who lead like his son, Jesus. So it's the natural outcome. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So, back to my two objectives for this morning. Number one, to convince you that the word meek does not mean weak. And number two, I'd convince you that to live meekly is the most compellingly beautiful way to live. And in fact, you'd be so excited about it, maybe you would skip out of here just looking for the next opportunity to be meek. How have I done? All right. I would love us to just take a minute to respond in prayer together. And so I'm going to ask you to stand and invite the worship team up. And I want to use the words, the lyrics of one of my favorite hymns, a, a hymn of surrender. If you feel able, I just want to pray this and then uh, the worship team will, will lead us in singing the refrain. But these are words from the hymn, I Surrender All. And this is the daily, hourly choice we make. So I'm going to pray this prayer, and you can either out loud or quietly in your hearts just pray this along with me. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me Jesus, take me now. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. All to Jesus I surrender. Now I feel the sacred flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation. Glory, glory to his name. I surrender all. I surrender all. 
all to Thee, my blessed Saviour, I surrender all. Amen.